history, apologetics, and current events. From the House Tops, coming up next. Immaculate Heart of Mary High School in Harvard, Massachusetts, had its 2024 commencement exercises on June 9th. The commencement speaker was Josh Hauser. Josh, with his wife and family, recently moved from Dallas, Texas, to enroll their children at Immaculate Heart of Mary School. Josh received his undergraduate degree from Appalachian State University in marketing and management. He received his MBA from Seattle University. He is currently a project management consultant in Boston. In his commencement address, Josh imparts some excellent advice to the class of 2024 and to all of us. Good morning to Brother Thomas, to our priests, the sisters, the brothers, other faculty, proud parents, family members, friends, and of course, the wonderful class of 2024. It's a privilege to stand before you today. To the graduates, congratulations. Today marks a significant milestone in your lives. I'd first like to speak on behalf of these young men and women here on the stage and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who supported our graduates along the way. To the parents and families, your decision to invest in an authentic Catholic education for your children is an unparalleled gift. An education at IHM, a place that puts first things first, is truly a gift that will never stop giving. On behalf of our graduates, we thank you. To the brothers, sisters, priests, and staff of this school, thank you for your relentless dedication to fulfilling your God-given vocation. You've not only imparted knowledge, but you've instilled values and virtue that will guide these young adults in all their future endeavors. You've taught the important lessons of life, being a model for how to know, love, and serve God. St. John Vianney, in talking about vocation, said, a soul that is consecrated to God cannot just live for itself, it must live for others. Through your vows and charism of imparting the true Catholic faith through this school, you exemplify what it means to live for others. Again, on behalf of our graduates, thank you. And to our graduates, today we celebrate the completion of a chapter, but not the journey. In this commencement address, I'm gonna do what all commencement speakers do and try to impart some advice. This advice, of course, you can choose to listen to or ignore. And with all humility before God, the advice I give will not be my own, but that of the perennial teachings of the Catholic faith applied to your lives here and now. This advice I assure you will make you happy in this life if you follow it. Now, if you remember anything from this speech, it's this advice. It's that you should ignore the most advice you receive, especially advice often told in commencement addresses. You see, most advice in this world is just a temptation in disguise. Not all advice is malicious, and may come from someone with good intentions, but the advice we listen to and act upon should always be ordered for our final good. Now, you usually bucket that advice into three categories. You have advice on how to obtain and maximize your pleasure in this life. You have advice on how to obtain and maximize your power in this life. And you have advice on how to obtain and maximize your prestige in this life. The three keys. Pleasure, power, and prestige. Now, what does the three keys have in common, and why is it bad? At the root of this is an important understanding of what truly makes us happy. The world will tell you, to be truly happy, you need to get what you want in this life. But that's not how life works. Nobody gets everything you naturally want. We all suffer, one way or another. Further, the hunger for pleasure, power, and prestige will only grow the more you feed it. How common is it for a rich man, the more rich and powerful he gets, the more he obsesses about you and becoming even more rich and powerful? It's a hunger that's never filled. And even if we take what we always want, we have concupiscence, and do our original sin, what we may instinctively want isn't always good for us. Trying to maximize my natural pleasure for eating good food can lead to gluttony. My natural drive of working hard and making more money can lead to avarice. My natural pleasure of relaxing and watching YouTube can lead to sloth. My natural yearning to be well-liked and popular can lead to pride. All deadly sins, you know. Pleasure, power, and prestige are not bad in themselves. God gave us the gifts of pleasure. 
God is referred to as all powerful himself. And Jesus is the most prestigious person to have ever been born. But when these things are made our idol, our final end, the object to which all of our happiness is based, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. So we need advice, such as follow your heart, look within, trust your instincts, to find what success means for you. It's our way to feel freedom to pursue your dreams. Follow these steps for how to win friends and influence people. Live and let live. Let passion be your guide. You should stop and think. Where is this advice ordered towards? If you were a natural inclination to sin, this advice can often be ordered towards just maximizing our pleasure, power, and prestige, making those our idols. And that isn't good for us and won't make us happy. Now, taking that advice that is ordered towards one focus on the three P's is nothing new. It's an old trick of the devil himself. After Jesus fasted 40 days in the desert, Satan came and put before Jesus three temptations disguised as advice. When Satan gave advice, it said, You must be hungry. Turn these stones into bread. He was telling Jesus to focus on pleasure. When Satan had the advice, he said Jesus should worship him and gain all the kingdoms of the world. Satan was telling Jesus to focus on power. But when Satan told Jesus to do a swan dive off the top of the temple, that will surely impress him. Satan was telling Jesus to focus on prestige. What was Jesus' response to all this advice in the desert from Satan? His response to each of these was to point not to his own will and wants, but to his father's. To the pleasure of bread, Jesus pointed to the supremacy of his father's word. To gain the power of the world, Jesus pointed to his father's power and how it's only him we should worship. And to the swan dying and gaining prestige, Jesus said we shouldn't test God and question his will, of course. If Jesus had a motto he lived by, it's this. Fiat voluntas tua, thy will be done. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. And that's the secret right there to unlocking a life full of happiness. Instead of focusing on yourself, on your own will, on your own wants, on your own inordinate desire for a life full of pleasure, power, and prestige, you should be focused on uniting yourself to the will of God. And if you do that, you will be happy beyond measure. Happiness isn't about getting what you want. Nobody gets everything they naturally want. Happiness isn't about getting what you want. It's about wanting what you get. Romans 8, 28 says, We need to know, you know that to them that love God, all things work together unto good, such as according to his purpose are called to be saints. All things work together unto good. Whether it's a huge blessing in your life, or a huge setback in adversity, it all comes from God through his active or permissive will. Alphonse the Great when asked who he considered the happiest person in the world, said, It's he who abandons himself to the will of God and accepts all things, prosperous and adverse, as coming from God. You see, the person who thinks happiness is all about getting what they want, his peace of mind depends on what happens to them each day. Today, they're happy. Say they spend their day fulfilling the pleasure of playing video games. Tomorrow, they might need a little challenge with a power outage or a sibling distracting them during video game play, and they immediately swing into anger and depression. A person, however, who focuses on uniting their will with God at all times knows that whatever the circumstance they find themselves in, good or bad, is something ruled by God. They're at constant peace. God wants what's best for you. Anything that's wrong in human life, whether it be a grace or setback, something good or bad, is all an opportunity for you to grow with safety all depending on how you react to it. That little sibling distracting you might be an opportunity to grow in patience. That misunderstanding with your teacher might be an opportunity for you to grow in humility. That sickness might be an opportunity to grow in trust in God. Whatever the reason you face adversity, it's a good reason, because God will it. But when you unite yourself with God's will, you should be thankful and you should be happy. St. Alphonsus McCoy says, Those who love God are always happy because their whole happiness is to fulfill, even in adversity, the will of God. He goes on to say that this is the happy lot of man who will only what God wills because everything that happens, save the sin, happens through the will of God. And nothing can take that happiness away from him. He says, This is the beautiful freedom of the sons of God, and it is worth asking more than all the right and distinction of blood and birth more than all the kingdoms of this world.
To practice always being happy, you can do three steps from St. Alphonsus' writings. First step is to recognize everything that happens in your life to say sin is God's will. Second step, unite your will to God's will. Discern what God is asking from you. Pray about it, listen. How should you react to the situation? How is this an opportunity to grow in sinking? Third step, be at peace. Trust in God. Know that He will only what's good for us, whether we understand it or not. I'd like to read a brief letter from someone I admire greatly that was written to his mother in the year 1941. My dearest mama, at the end of the month of May, I was transferred to the camp of Auschwitz. Everything is going well with me. Be tranquil about me and about my health, because the good God is everywhere and provides for everything with love. It would be best not to write to me until you receive further news from me, because I do not know how long I shall stay here. Heartfelt greetings and kisses. Raymond. Now, Raymond's religious name was Maximilian Kobe. You all are sure know the story. This letter written to his mother, one that gives you a profound sense of peace and love, was the last letter that Maximilian Kobe would ever write. A short time later, a prisoner escaped from Auschwitz, prompting the king's commander to select ten men to be starved to death as a punishment and deterrent against future escape attempts. When one of the selected men cried out in despair for his wife and children, Maximilian Kobe volunteered to step forward and asked to take his place. His request was granted. We'll be back with more from the housetops after this break. Hi, this is Tom Price from EWTN saying thanks for listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Catholic Radio serving Shirley, Fitchburg, and the world. A word from Father Henry. I want to welcome you all to the month of June, the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. June is the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in recognition of uh, Jesus' apparition to St. Margaret Mary Alaco um, that began in 1673. Mary Alaco was a, a member of the Visitation Sisters and through her, Jesus asked for devotion to his Sacred Heart. And you may ask, why this celebration? Why the devotion? Sacred Heart of Jesus is a symbol of God's boundless and passionate love for humanity. The heart is a seed of love and it's an expression of Jesus, God's love for humanity, which we celebrate. We are not to be damned because God has mercy for us. So we continue to pray to the Sacred Heart of Jesus uh, to win God's mercy for us and for the world and uh, to propagate divine mercy and God's love for us. And the values of um, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is a uh, love for one another. So we love one another and then we inspire others to love and also we offer others comfort. We have to provide comfort to others. These are the values of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and this celebration. And how are we to honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus? We have to reflect on the promises of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we know that Jesus gave these promises to uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, the Apostle of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And then we pray for the reunion of divided families. Uh, we need to pray for reunion of families that are separated or divided. And we also have to pray the litany of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, as well as contemplate um, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, probably with, with music, music, the food of the soul. Uh, we put a music uh, that has to do with the Sacred Heart of Jesus, or has to do with God's love for us, and then we meditate on God's love for us. Thank you as we honor this morning and honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus. God bless you. Hi everybody, I'm Father Elias and I'm inviting you to join me on a Catholic pilgrimage to Japan in 2024. Come with me to visit and learn about the rich Catholic history of the land of the rising sun where St. Francis Xavier brought the faith. The persecution of the faith for over 250 years, the witness of the Japanese martyrs and saints, the story of the hidden Christians, St. Maximilian Kolbe's friary in Nagasaki, Mugenze no Sono, the Garden of the Immaculate, and also we'll visit Holy Mary Canone of Hara Castle, the largest wooden statue of Our Lady in the world. 
the atomic bomb miracles, and of course, Our Lady's apparition at Akita, a most relevant Marian apparition of our times. We also visit beautiful Mount Fuji, the atomic bomb museums in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ride the bullet train, and view the cherry blossoms in springtime. We will have daily mass and rosary along with the liturgy of the hours and other devotional prayers. We will prepare for and make our consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary at her apparition site in Akita. Because of an increased interest, we are offering both a spring and a fall pilgrimage in the year 2024. For more information, please go online to CanterburyPilgrimages.com. That is CanterburyPilgrimages.com. Or call 800-653-0017. That again is 800-653-0017. Hope you can join us. Hope to see you there. Ave Maria. When Our Lady appeared to the children of Fatima, one of the things she said to them every time she appeared is, I want you to come here on the 13th of each month. So I like to promote our candlelight processions at the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in Brighton on the 13th of each month from May through October at 8 p.m. We have Father Ed Riley who's coming, who's a chaplain of the World Apostle of Fatima and a regular at the Shrine. So please join us, 8 p.m. 155 Washington Street, Brighton. Hi, this is Peter and Jeremy of Your Prayer Intentions reminding you that if you want to get a prayer request to us, there are many ways to do it. You can email us at wqph893 at comcast.net. That's wqph893 at comcast.net. You can tweet us at Radio WQPH. That's Radio WQPH. You can post your prayer request on our prayer wall so that many people can pray for it. That's at wqphradio.org slash prayer wall. Or if you're not a computer person, you can call us at 978-343-0893. 978-343-0893. For private prayer intention, simply say or send the word private. And we hope to catch you every Saturday at noon on Your Prayer Intentions right here on WQPH Radio. Goodbye and God bless you all. The ten prisoners were taken to an underground starvation bunker. According to witnesses, Kobe was by all measures happy. He led the prisoners in constant prayers, hymns, and recitations of the rosary. He provided comfort and hope to his fellow prisoners. He encouraged them to endure their sufferings with courage and trust in God's will. After two weeks in the starvation bunker, Maximilian Kobe was the last survivor, and he was still singing hymns, happy by all parents. The guards, eager to speed things along, gave Kobe a lethal injection of carbolic acid. Maximilian Kobe is reported to have lifted his arm for his executioner, happy to fill God's will in that moment to become a martyr, a hero of the faith. If Maximilian Kobe can be happy in Auschwitz, we can be happy regardless of our present circumstance. All of you unite yourself with God's will. Now what is God's will for you? It's simple. God is calling each of you to be saints. What that looks like will be different for each of you. But if you're committed to discerning in prayer what's God's will for you and aligning your will with His, I assure you God will make it clear. God wants what's best for us. Again, first step, recognize everything that happens in your life is God's will. Second step, React and align your will with God's will. And third step, be at peace, trust in God, and be happy. Now that is all easy in theory, but it can be hard to practice. We still have temptations. We still have people giving us advice on how to maximize our pleasure, power, and prestige. So what can you do? I recommend the fact. To battle the morning desire for pleasure, I recommend this. Do something hard every day. Pick something, anything. You can fast from 12 to 3. You can wake up, jump on your knees, and say three Hail Marys. Whatever it is, stick to it, no matter how you feel. The mortification you practice will give you discipline and help you take no when those larger temptations inevitably come. To value your desire for pleasure, do something hard every day. To value your morning desire for power, be a slave of Mary. Live out your Marian consecration. Say your morning offering and mean it. Give up your power, your needs, your works, your joys, your sufferings. Give it all to Mary. She is the perfect saint, modeled perfectly that motto of our Lord, Thy will be done. Offer everything you have to Mary, who will dispose of your merits in perfect union with God's will. 
To battle your desire for power, be a slave of Mary. And to battle your desire for prestige, go to confession regularly. You shouldn't be so thought of with what the world thinks of you, or where you stand with God. Know thyself. What's your predominant fault? Pray about it. Find it. Take action to improve. To battle your desire for prestige, humble yourself and go to confession regularly. Do something hard every day, be a slave of Mary, and go to confession regularly. When you follow this advice, you won't be like the rest of the world. Others think happiness is all about getting what you want. True happiness is not about getting what you want, it's about wanting what you get. Whatever you get from it, you know it's God's will. React and align your will with His, and have peace, and be happy, knowing that God wills only what's good for us, whether we understand it or not. People in this community, the brothers and sisters, are honestly the happiest people I've ever met. All because we have your will to God's will. When you leave this community, this amazing bubble, you're going to meet a lot of unhappy people in this world. People focus on always trying to get what they want, and they're not happy because nobody gets everything they naturally want. Don't let those people drag you down. Be a shining light for them. Be joyful. Let them see the light of Christ in you. Those who love God, uniting their will to His, are always happy. Congratulations again to the class of 2024. Christ is King to the heights. From the Housetops is a Catholic periodical dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Its purpose is to proclaim the faith clearly and without compromise. Each issue of From the Housetops offers the priceless truth and wisdom of the Catholic faith through inspirational lives of the saints and timeless treasures of Catholic doctrine. To get subscription information, back issues, and a free copy, go to saintbenedict.com, S-A-I-N-T, benedict.com, and look for From the Housetops. Hammond's Meditations on Divine Providence Nothing happens in the universe without God willing or permitting it. He alone rules everything with infinite wisdom, with a strength which nothing can resist, and with a more than paternal goodness to such an extent that not even a hair falls from our head without his permission. To appreciate without reference to providence the events which take place in this world, the events within families, in towns, and in states, in the church, and throughout the whole universe, is to look upon life, look upon the things of this world, as a pagan. In addition to this general providence, God has a special providence which he exercises towards those who love him. He watches over them with particular tenderness and attention, as over his favorite friends, his cherished children, and he shows himself to be rich in goodness and mercy towards them. Thus it follows that not to abandon ourselves with full confidence to his providence is to misunderstand his power, which can do all things, his goodness, which wills all kinds of good on our behalf, his wisdom, whose lights are always infinite, his purposes, which are always most holy, and his means for attaining them, which are always most admirable. Often his reasons are unknown to us. His designs escape our short-sightedness. But what we cannot comprehend here below, we shall understand in heaven. In heaven where we shall praise God, who has done all things well. In the meantime, let us live in a state of abandonment and confidence. This abandonment will be a source of peace and consolation for us. Persuaded that God watches over us, we shall be at rest, and looking upon ourselves as beloved children in the arms of the best of fathers, we shall say, Why do I trouble myself? Why do I afflict myself? Even when human means fail and men are opposed to me, I will rejoice for an opportunity which enables me more perfectly to practice holy abandonment to divine providence and confidence in its goodness. Even when I may have sinned, I will always have confidence because God is the father of the repentant prodigal and has promised pardon to the publican who humbles himself. Thus, I ought always to confide in God without being troubled or allowing myself to be cast down. Moreover, God does not wish that our abandonment to his divine providence should be idle. 
He desires that we should give him our cooperation, our concurrence, that we should be his helps and his arms. In what concerns us personally, he desires that we should do everything which depends upon us, awaiting success, not from our own efforts, but from his goodness, which alone can enable us to succeed. And as regards our neighbor, he desires us to be good, charitable, compassionate, the worthy agents of his love in doing good to men. Happy are those who, entering into these designs of God, endeavor to do their neighbor all the good they can, and to show themselves in everything, like to Jesus Christ, full of compassion for human misery, full of kindness towards all to whom they can render any service. They will, at the last day, enjoy the happiness of hearing from the mouth of the judge himself these sweet words, Come ye blessed of my Father, I was hungry, and you gave me to eat, I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. Do we thus cooperate with divine providence regarding ourselves or our neighbor? Dr. Paul Lavin, a traditional Catholic psychologist, summarizes in vivid detail the challenges young Catholics must face today. In his book, Keeping the Faith, A Young Catholic's Guide to Coping with a Secular World, Dr. Lavin identifies the enemy, Satan, and his increasing influence in the world. He wrote this 66-page manual specifically for the young practicing Catholic student who will soon be leaving home and entering the world. To help them avoid becoming Catholic dropouts once they enter a secular world so antagonistic to their Catholic faith. The author also suggests that keeping the faith is a perfect tool for parents and teachers in their efforts to direct and guide the young people whom God has placed under their care. You can receive a free copy of Keeping the Faith, A Young Catholic's Guide to Coping with a Secular World by contacting info at saintbenedict.com. That's info at s-a-i-n-t benedict, b-e-n-e-d-i-c-t dot com. The Manual for Total Consecration to Mary. This book contains the readings and prayers for St. Louis de Montfort's 33 days of preparation for consecrating oneself to Jesus through Mary. This manual includes complete texts from Holy Scripture, The Imitation of Christ, Montfort's writings and prayers used for total consecration, all in this one handy volume. The Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of St. Benedict Center are pleased to make this manual available for those committing themselves to Mary for the first time or for those who wish to renew their consecration previously made. Available exclusively from St. Benedict Center. Go to stbenedict.com gift shop and order your copy of the Manual for the Total Consecration to Mary. From the House Stops is produced by the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.